Now that we've discussed amino acids, uh, we can start looking at polymerized chains of these amino acids. So, and from there we can look at uh, a macromolecules that are important uh, for function inside of uh, biological systems. So the first one, uh, first macromolecular structure we're going to look at, uh, based on our conversation of amino acids, proteins. And from here, we can really start to think about how structure defines function, which is a theme throughout biochemistry that we're going to keep seeing, and also a theme in general uh, through chemistry. Uh, so if we look at a few structures, uh, what we see here on the right are three different protein structures that all have different functions inside of a cell. So for instance, in the upper left hand corner, this is myoglobin, which is used for O2 storage. Uh, lysozyme down here on the bottom is for carbohydrate cleavage. It's, uh, importantly, it cleaves uh, the cell wall, um, which is composed of uh, uh, different carbohydrates. Um, it can decompose the cell wall of bacteria. On the right is trypsin, uh, which can cleave proteins or polypeptides at very specific spots uh, within the amino acid sequence. And as you look at these structures, what you can see is that no, none of them are identical. And that's because uh, the structure of the protein is really important for its function. It defines its function, in fact. And if we have different changes to the structure, we, uh, we cause a change in the function of the protein or uh, eliminate the original function of the protein. So when we say structure of a protein, what we're talking about is three-dimensional structure. And so for proteins, uh, the uh, end game of this is basically tertiary or quaternary structure. Uh, depending on whether this is a, a multi-subunit protein or a non-multi-subunit protein. So what we're going to first uh, discuss is what is the foundation uh, for the structure, and that's called primary structure. And what that is, is that's just the amino acid sequence of the protein. Uh, this is really important because uh, depending on what the amino acid sequence is, this causes uh, different uh, motifs which uh, make up what's called the secondary structure. So you can, uh, an example of motif is shown here as an alpha helix. Uh, but there are also things like beta sheets and several other uh, secondary structure motifs. These then fold into each other to start making uh, this three-dimensional structure, which is known as tertiary structure, and then quaternary structures for multi-subunit proteins. We'll discuss all this a lot more uh, in uh, subsequent chapters, but right now we're going to focus here on primary structure. So remember that uh, polypeptides uh, that you just learned about uh, are chains of amino acids. Uh, they have, they're linked by condensation reactions to form these uh, polypeptide bonds. Here. Okay, those are different polypeptide bonds. And then, for instance, we can, uh, we can look at, uh, we can simplify this so that we can look at uh, the primary structure. Uh, so for instance, if we have uh, this polypeptide chain where there's a methionine, a histidine, a glycine, a glutamate, and an alanine, we can express this in the three letter codes of the amino acids. Uh, so, for instance, in this case, met, his, gly, glu, alanine, or we can express this in the one-letter code, so M H G E A. So, knowing these abbreviations allows us to look at a chain of uh, amino acids, so a polypeptide sequence, and be able to tell something about their properties. And so, when we have a chain of less than 40 amino acids, we call this a polypeptide. Whereas, when we have a chain of greater than 40 amino acids, we uh, distinguish that as a protein. And the reason for this is that around 40 amino acids is when we start to see, um, instead of there being kind of very loosely held chains of amino acids, you get to see uh, better defined three-dimensional structures. And remember, this three-dimensional structure is really important uh, for the function of a lot of these proteins. 
Okay, so what can we tell just by looking at the primary structure? So again, like I said uh, before, that the primary structure is really important on influencing the three-dimensional structure of the protein. Uh, however, it's really hard to predict that just by looking at the primary structure. But there are certain things that we can uh, figure out just by looking at this amino acid sequence. Uh, for instance, we can see the molecular weight. Uh, we can predict the UV, vis, uh, the UV visible absorbance spectrum. We can predict the PI. And we can predict uh, the possibility of disulfide bridges forming. So we'll break this down a little bit. So, as you would expect, so these are several proteins. Uh, these are the number of amino acids uh, residues that they have uh, in their amino acid sequence. And these are the molecular weights. And you see, uh, for instance, if we just look at single subunit, that's really hard to see. Um, so if we look at the first three, so proteinase, uh, proteinase inhibitor 3, uh, cytochrome C, and myoglobin. These all have one subunit, and so we can directly compare them. So the first one has 30 amino acid residues, the second 104, the third 153. And you see the corresponding molecular masses go up. So this goes up from about uh, 3.4 kilodaltons, or uh, 3,400 daltons, to uh, almost 17,000 Daltons. And then if we look down here to RNA polymerase, which is also a single subunit, has 883 amino acid residues, and that goes even up, uh, that goes higher to 98,885 Daltons. And so that makes sense. The more amino acid residues we have, the higher the molecular weight of the protein is going to be. And so all amino acids contribute, uh, uh, all amino acids within the primary sequence contribute to this molecular weight. Ah, there we go. Now, aromatic amino acids, so when we talk about aromatic amino acids, we're talking about particularly three uh, amino acids. And that's that's going to be phenylalanine, tryptophan, and uh, tyrosine. And just for fun, here's their one-letter codes. Over here on the right is the UV vis absorption, ah, absorption spectrum uh, for phenylalanine, uh, shown in purple, tyrosine in blue, and tryptophan in orange. So recall for uh, UV uh, or a visible spectrum. On the bottom, we have uh, the uh, wavelength of the light that's being absorbed. So this goes from about 190 nanometers to 320 nanometers on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're looking at extinction coefficients, which is known as the molar absorptivity coefficient. And so, if I recall what that is, is that is from Beer's Law which is also shown in the slide here. So this is called the molar absorptivity coefficient. Ah, and those are mislabeled. So let me correct that. Molar absorptivity. Coefficient. Okay, this is the absorbance. The units for molar absorptivity coefficient are per molar per centimeter. And then these other two are correct in the slide, so this is path length. which is expressed in centimeters. And this is concentration 
of the species you're looking at. And that has units of molarity. Okay? So, on the y-axis then, this is the molar absorptivity coefficient that we're seeing. And so the larger uh, the molar absorptivity coefficient is, uh, the more uh, that this uh, molecule uh, absorbs at a particular wavelength. And so you can see then uh, from this that there are different uh, lambda maxes for tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. So tryptophan is around 280 nanometers. Tyrosine is a little bit uh, lower than 280 nanometers, and phenylalanine is around 260 nanometers. You also notice that the relative absorbances, uh, the relative extinction coefficients for each of these uh, changes. So tryptophan uh, absorbs the highest. It absorbs the most um, at an extinction coefficient around 6,000 or 7,000 per molar per centimeter. Tyrosine is less uh, between 2,000 and 1,000. Phenylalanine is actually quite low at about 200 uh, per molar per centimeter. The point is that uh, when you, uh, you can look at the primary sequence, you can look at the amino acid sequence and predict what sort of absorptivity you'd expect at about 280 nanometers. And so the more tryptophans uh, there are in the sequence, the higher the absorbances, or really the more there are of any of these aromatic residues, the higher the absorbance is going to be. And typically we look at uh, the 280 nanometer uh, when we're looking at this, which we call, um, th this is usually where we look at, which is also expresses absorbance at 280. Okay. Moving on. Uh, recall uh, from the last section, we're looking at amino acids, that you can calculate the PI. And so this is going to be dependent on the charged amino acids. Um, so that's going to be dependent on the charge of the amino acids. And the PI, uh, depending on what the uh, what charged amino acids are available within the protein, is going to change, uh, again, based on the primary structure, based on what charged amino acids are available. And you can range in the PI of a protein uh, from less than 1 uh, up to 12.1, as you can see in this table. And this can range, uh, this can range a lot um, for proteins. Finally, we can predict if there are possible disulfide bridges in the protein. And so a disulfide bridge forms uh, between cysteines. So between two cysteines specifically. So this is, uh, this can be catalyzed. Uh, or uh, this often happens just in air, and you form uh, from two thiols, you can form what's called a disulfide. So within a protein, so cysteines within a protein can form crosslinks uh, with each other uh, between two cysteines. So uh, down here is a structure of insulin, and so there are three disulfide bridges uh, shown between uh, six cysteines. And so this is really important. Um, this is ultimately very important for the uh, three-dimensional structure of this protein and uh, provides it some stability uh, and also uh, what the uh, influences what the shape of insulin is going to be. And that's, again, really important for function. And so if we see cysteines uh, within uh, the amino acid sequence of a protein, we can, we can uh, hypothesize that how many disulfide bridges are possible. Uh, but really, it's not until we actually know the structure of the protein um, uh, or if we get more information about the protein that we know that those disulfides are made, but uh, we can predict if, they're, uh, if there's a possibility of them forming. So in the end, uh, what we're really looking at uh, or we're looking at a lot uh, throughout this class is the between structure and function. We want to see that relationship. Uh, we don't know what changes the function of different molecules involved in biology. And so how do we really determine structure and function? Uh, well, we have to first be able to purify the protein. In a lot of cases, we really need to find a way to separate the protein 
uh, from the other proteins that are involved in the cell. And there are many, many proteins uh, that are in uh, every cell. So we have to have, use different techniques in order to do this. And then once we isolate the protein, then we can uh, do experiments to test the structure and the function. And we'll go over those um, in later chapters uh, as we continue. Right now, what we're going to start looking at uh, are how do we separate proteins from each other? And then how do we determine the primary uh, amino acid sequence uh, for a protein, which helps us start our studies.